Let's talk about transplant since we've mentioned that. Um, is, the, is the transplant the goal for all eligible patients? And I know there will be differences of opinion <laughs> here, so I'm going to start with a transplant fan. Is yes. that why you uh, put Paul at the other end of the table? <laughs> <laughs> Split you up. Uh, tell us why you think everybody needs a transplant. And, and, and more specifically, tell us what the data at this meeting is that leads you to support that conclusion. So I would touch upon two major trials, and one of them is actually Paul's trial that was presented at last year's meeting, looking at what I would consider sort of standard of care induction in the U.S., RVD, one arm getting uh, continued RVD, the other arm going to early transplant, followed by RVD consolidation, both arms getting lenalidomide maintenance for a year, and a significant progression-free survival benefit to the early RVD arm. And I know Paul's going to jump mm. in and say, but there's no overall survival mm. benefit. But again, this is with the length of follow-up that we have. Um, and I think that if you continue to follow, and if we look at depth of responses, we may ultimately see that benefit. The other thing I would say is we have data at this meeting looking at cyborg followed by single or tandem transplant from the European groups compared to a VMP arm. And that's much more reflective, again, of real world in Europe also showing a progression-free survival benefit to early transplant. Mm -hmm. And then the last point I want to make, because I know Paul is dying to jump in, is if you look in the United States, only 20% of patients who are eligible for transplant are actually referred for transplant. Mm -hmm. So I think at the very least, it's important that patients are allowed to have that discussion. Mm -hmm. Right. I was struck, we did a meeting yesterday, and we asked the audience uh, about a case, and we asked a transplant eligible patient how many would send them for transplant. 97% of the audience, mm. Paul said, they would send them for transplant. Mm. And I think you've got an uphill battle convincing people to delay transplant. But tell us why you think we well, should maybe well, do I that. Well, think, I think Amrita touched on it. The US outcomes for myeloma are the best in the world. So if we were failing our patients by not transplanting everyone, why do we have the best outcomes in the world? Uh, with the data that you just shared. My take on this, and Amrita knows this, I mean, I attend on the transplant service, so I'm very comfortable offering transplant to the appropriate patient. My position is simply that one size does not fit all, and I think at this, in this meeting, we're hearing more and more information that in Europe, certainly, where salvage strategies are different, practice patterns are different, obviously, all your good approaches need to be used relatively early to, be to ensure a better outcome. In the US, we're blessed with great salvage options, and in that context, for certain patients, it may be reasonable to collect, store, and wait. And I think our French study shows clearly the progression-free survival benefit, and I think Amrita is quite right. It's striking. What is equally striking, though, is given the depth of that PFS difference, there isn't an OS difference. And certainly we know that patients OS are being, being overall survival. Exactly. And so I think what it tells our patients is that they may have a choice. So I think we're actually much closer than we might be implied by sitting here. Um, <laughs> because in fact, what, what I would say is it's clearly a standard option, but it's an option. And the issue for a patient is collect and wait may be reasonable, or it may be better to go straight. And I think until we actually have more information on subgroups of patients who benefit versus not, the current trials are going to be so important in addressing that question. And it's great, actually, because everyone at this table is participating in various studies that are looking at this. And I think critically, um, we're going to learn that particularly with the advent of antibodies and other strategies, this philosophy of tailoring treatment and sparing patients toxicity, both acute and long term, may be very important. So I want to do, sorry mm. to, I just, mm. I just want to dig a little bit into mm. the, the new data at this meeting, and yep. particularly I want to talk about first the, 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 the two major, three major groups, European, English, and, and the STAM in a trial from the US that looked at the issue, not just of transplant, also of consolidation and second transplant. Now, I'm going to pick on you again, Amrita, because you're actually the, one of the lead investigators on the stamina trial. And you want to tell the audience what that is and what the conclusions of that trial are? So, I mean, this was a tremendous trial in the US of 700 patients. So it's a real testament to all of mm. us working together. Three-arm trial, uh, we did not mandate what induction regimen. So I think that's a very important point in, in contrast to the European trials. Patients got a standard autologous transplant with high-dose malphalan. And then one arm got lenalidomide maintenance one arm got a second transplant, followed by lenalidomide maintenance, and one arm got RVD consolidation, followed by lenalidomide maintenance. And with our follow-up now at about 38 months, we did not see a significant difference between any of those arms. 
and I think you can interpret that in a matter of ways. My interpretation of that is if you have a good induction regimen, then doing a single transplant followed by lenalidomide maintenance is very good therapy. Now, who wants to take on the European trial? Because it was somewhat contradictory with your trial. Uh, Sagar, you want to take on uh, the Hovon or the German study? Yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, sort of in summary, because it's a very complicated trial <laughs> with multiple mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. areas of randomization, yes. but one of the take-home messages from the European presenters is that tandem transplant offers benefit, particularly for the high-risk subsets of patients. And I think part of the reason why... Which, which? Your trial did not show, right? Uh, my tri yes, our, our trial, even in high-risk patients, did not show benefit right. to tandem. So I think, I think one of the real differences between these two is the efficacy of the induction yes, therapy. Yes, I agree. I and agree in the European regimen, they used VCD, which um, you know, I think is, a, is a not the optimal induction regimen. We don't know what the U.S. investigators got, but I suspect a significant fraction got RVD exactly. because Absolutely. that is part of the practice pattern in the U.S. And so I think, um, you know, a lot of this discussion over transplant early, transplant late really speaks to the quality of the induction regimen you're giving because that probably influences your CR rate and that influences yes. the post-transplant outcomes. And it might yeah, not ahead, simply sir. be, um, you know, just the quality of induction. You know, there, you know, these patients are coming in with different burdens of disease and different disease biologies. So, you know, there are patients that we are going to overtreat. Uh, with induction, transplant, uh, consolidation, and or maintenance, we haven't figured out which those, which ones those are. Is it the revised ISS or not? Mm. And this this kind of leads into you know what Paul was saying about personalizing therapies yes, exactly. and, and you know not approaching things in a one size fits all. But let's uh, it, it, let's. Um, is anybody doing tandem transplant routinely? I think the answer is probably no. No, no. no. but we're all collecting for two. If yeah, I would, yeah. Yeah. But that's true. That's true. That is true. Yeah. Now let's just. Uh,